<laughs> Hi, everybody. It's Game Changers with Bet Sussman. Bet, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, we for a while, right? You know, yeah. And and I think. Hi, oh God, I'm trying to uh, to silence the uh, the feed. I have another feed going so that I'll be able to read the comments. I don't think you'll be able to see them on your. Okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll see you later. But you'll see it later, yeah. Oh, you're getting love though. They're sending up this sending up smiles and love. Oh, excellent. Hey everybody. Hey everybody, what's up? <laughs> oh, hey Phil. Um, oh, and I see I have notifications going off and I turned them off. I, I hate computers today. I'm I'm not they're not being my friend. Well, you have to go to the right notifications. You know, there's that whole list underneath it. Like I went just now, what I did was I said, let me just turn off messages. Right. Oh, see, I turned off everything and I'm still beeping. So there you go. Hello, Maria. Um, okay, so people are joining. Hi, Tony. Um, Tony made that great. I don't know if you saw the poster today of uh, your, the collage of your photos. Oh, I did. That was, you know, that was, a, I mean, it was an, when I saw it, I was like an awful lot of me. <laughs> it's a lot. It's it good. was chock full of me. But um, this is Trip down memory lane, say. Yes, Tony Vincent is a is, was a rock photographer back in the day. You might have known her in New York because she used to shoot. Uh, she used to shoot everybody actually. Her name is really familiar to me. Yeah, so she's the one who put the collage together. And, nice. Uh, and yeah, it would look great. Did those nice pictures? Hi, Anne. Um, so I didn't ask you before we went live, and I usually do. If there's anything I'm not allowed to ask you, or if there's anything you won't talk about on the air. Little late now, <laughs> so so we're kind of we're kind of going. So I, put your glass on for a second. I have to show them. We're old Jews with big glasses. Do you remember that bit on Letterman when he used to do old Jews with big glasses, and it would be yeah. like, oh yeah, it would be like uh, like Carol Channing and and George Burns. Yeah. He would like do all those the, the old people. We're we're not old Jews. We're we're we're, we're, we're well, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, but we're oh, not Eddie Brill is on. Hi, Eddie. Oh, hey, Eddie. What's up? Um, so Marge, who's on, um, has the has the COVID now. Oh, geez. and oh, I'm so sorry, Marge. And she got it because she went to a lab to get blood drawn, and all nine lab employees had the COVID. Oh my God! And gave it to fifteen of the twenty-five people sitting in the in the waiting room that day. Wait, why just that day? Were were they there the day before? I'm sure there are other days where there are. Because I can tell you all about like when you're contagious because I actually took a course in contact tracing. Okay, I, we we have to. I, I know this I, is not why you're on the show, but we are called the COVID crazies, the people who watch my show every day, yeah. and and I know that you had. So so how do you know how you got the COVID? Yeah, I mean, it could only be um, the day that I I, I, I took, a, you know, I live a block from Central Park. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I took, I, no, I get in on 94th Street. I always mm -hmm. go, it was a beautiful day, walked in, uh -huh. made the right to go. What I usually do is go down to like 72nd, then come back around. It was right. like really crowded that day, much more crowded than it had been. Um, it was like, it was April the 8th. Okay. Were you, were you wearing a mask back then? Oh yeah, Ma mask and gloves. Never okay. walked. From, the, from March 14th, I never walked out of my apartment, even to go to the trash room two doors down without a mask and gloves. Yes. I don't, now I'm not a little as crazy with the gloves. I always wear the mask, but I don't wear the gloves. I just take sanitizer and, oops, sorry. Right. The sanitizer and, and whatnot, and wipes and whatnot, so I'm, so I'm protected. But, um, Hi, John Heyman. Do you know John? Heyman. <laughs> what the heck, Heyman? <laughs> Have you eaten pizza with John? No, but I was watching, I, I was reading a post of his the other day about a pizza. Something oh, yeah. oh, yes. There's many posts about pizza. Um, we're going to talk about your food thing, too. Okay, so you're walking in the park, 72nd Street. Beautiful no, day. 4th Street. It was really crowded. There were a lot of runners, no masks, people traveling in packs, no masks. And I ended up getting out at 86th Street and, uh, and that day. And then I walked up to Columbus Avenue and I went into a Dwayne Reed a place that I knew took it seriously because I had seen people like online outside six feet apart. So they were doing that, not letting, you know, not letting a certain, only letting a certain amount of people in. Right. 
I went in there, there were like three or four of us in there wearing masks, <clears throat> gloves, get what I need, get in line. And there's a guy, there's even a guy behind me wearing masks and gloves. And I even asked him to move back a few feet. I said, do, do you mind just moving back a little bit? Uh -huh. This is the beginning. This is when it was right. cuckoo, you know? Right. So well, this is when it was really bad in New York, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. When it was really bad in New York. So anyway, so then he moved back and this girl walks in, like we were opening the, making way for her to get in line without a mat, no mask, no gloves. So it was either that or it was uh, in the park. I, I don't know. It was either, either one. But I was wearing a mask, so... Everybody else was protected if I had it, but you know. So how many how many days after that day did you start to have symptoms? Um, over the uh, that was Thursday. By Saturday, I started feeling like I was coming down with a, a a cold or something. I started feeling a little stuffy, and and um and then by uh, by Monday, I was you know I was on my I was on my, on my deathbed, and by Tuesday, I was half dead. <laughs> okay, so you got the bad COVID. So. And they say load, though, is such a big part of it. And if it was just being outside or even in a store briefly, it would seem you wouldn't get that big a load. No? That's the only way it could have been. That's the only place it could have been. Okay. The only place I was where people weren't wearing masks. I really, at that point, I didn't go anywhere. I basically would go once a week to the corner market little mom and pop market, mm -hmm. you know, I'd look in the, I'd look in to see how many people and if everybody was wearing masks, which they were because they had signs, everybody had to wear a mask. And I would go in, I'd make a list so that I didn't mill around. I would just right. get out. So I don't think it was there. I really think it was, it was that day because I wasn't even in the grocery store in that, that market that day. You know, I, I was, you know, it was two days after my walk. So two days. Okay, so that's on the on the on the quick end. And and what did you did you lose your taste of senses? Your sense of smell, taste? No, I didn't lose any of that, and I didn't have the cough. What I okay. had the insane headaches, the Ooh. stuffed head where you feel as if like you feel like there's a wet towel filling up your head trying to get out, and and it, it, with the kind of pain that you pray for migraines. That's how bad, that's how bad these are. And they would like one headache would last for three days. That was bad. And I had fever and I had my digestive um, nonsense was not great. Was really, okay. and I have to say that I think, you know, when people talk about, you know, having long-term effects from it, you know, I think that if anything is, I don't think I fully, my GI is not, I don't think is completely back to normal. It's irregular. It's just, uh, you know, some days it feels good, some days it doesn't. It's, it's just kind of odd. It, it comes and goes. So I don't think that, uh, I think that's a lingering effect. But um, other than that, how about, how about um, fatigue? Did you have the. Oh, I saw unbelievable fatigue. Unbelievable fatigue. Felt like I was, my body felt like I was hit by a truck. You know, everything hurt. You just were just, were just so comfortable in your own skin. Um, and I just. How, how long were you sick, Ben? I was in bed for 16 days. Wow. And then how much longer after that well, did you? Well, then for two days I would go out, I'd maybe sit at the piano and I'd play for a few minutes. And and then I would go sit on the sofa and turn the TV on. And then I would, that would be last about 15 minutes. And I'd go, okay, I'm done, <laughs> go back to bed. Wow, wow. So it was really, I think it was 18 days before I said, no more made made the bed. No more bed, bed. No more bed. So, how long till you felt able to like go? Like how long till you had bed energy back? Couple a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of weeks. So the GI thing. I actually got a CAT scan last week because I've had GI issues for like six weeks. Just rumbling stomach, painful. Not the runs. Not the other thing. Just bad stomach. Just and I. Read Huh? I said just odd stuff. Yeah, and I read that 5% of the COVID people don't have any other symptom. They go get a CAT scan and then they find the white cloud of COVID in their lower lungs. And so I'm kind of, God forbid, semi expecting that because six weeks of having weird stomach is... Did you have a test? Did you get tested? You know, I don't really believe in the test because I everybody I know who's had COVID tested negative. 
and then they got the I, antibody I, test. I didn't get the test. I didn't get tested. Mm -hmm. When I, I had three telemedicine calls while I was sick. And all three doctors, when I said, I said, should I go get a test? And they said, they, they all said, no, you, you have COVID. Yeah. You, this is, you have COVID. So yeah. there are all the symptoms of COVID. Anyway, enough and, about COVID. No, all right, well, one more question. So have you, I was listening to Chris Cuomo the other night, and he was saying that he was having dinner with his daughter and he couldn't find a word. And she goes, dad, what, what, what's going on with you? And he said, that's been happening. He's, he's what's called a long hauler. He's had some issues. Mm -hmm. um, have you found that um, brain fog at all? Honey, I've had brain fog. <laughs> Honey, I've had brain fog. But I have, but I'm just, you know, I mean, I just think, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I repeat myself. I say this, I, you know, I repeat myself and forget things. But, you know, I'm also, you know, we get a little bit older and you know, I'm not that old, but I mean, as we look. Look, what's her name? Kardashian is getting implants in her butt and in her eyes and her nose and everything. So it's 22. So <laughs> anyway, saw them. They All right. So, yeah. okay. So wait, before we leave this, why did you take a course in COVID tracing? Um, uh, because I thought contact trace, contact, contact tracing. Contact tracing. It, it's needed. They need contact tracers. But if I tell you that I'd have a better luck, you know, whatever it's so it's so difficult doing it online i you know i just want to find that's why i posted one day is has anybody you know con done any contact tracing uh-huh then you could maybe somebody could hook me up directly with the boss or something you know it's i mean right. I, I would do it like i wouldn't want to do it full time but i do it part time because i think right now it's really necessary and my business is 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 on hold so i Absolutely. have time to do that right now and it would be a good thing to do so I took the course. It was a week and, you know, passed with flying colors. And <laughs> I didn't realize that that contact tracers were doing it online. I didn't even realize that. No, no, no. I was taking the test. I took the test online. But you have Go ahead. And I'm applying for, I was applying for jobs. Trying right. to find a place that needed a contact tracer. Doesn't have to be in New York. It, it, it you know, it just has mm -hmm. to have to be able to have a good phone, working phone, you know. Right. You just, okay. I gotcha. So, so you, so as of now though, you feel pretty much like yourself. Yeah. That's a wonderful thing. And you, I saw that you went and gave plasma, which is really wonderful of you. I did, and they wrote me back and they said, thank you. And come back. You've got, plasma. so I had a lot of, I had a lot of um, antibodies. Did, now, did it make you nervous to go into a place to give plasma that no, do you feel protected now that you have antibodies? Well, no, not really. I mean, didn't you read about the guy in Hong Kong? I did. And um, so I don't know how long. I mean, maybe the fact that I had so many antibodies, maybe it'll take a little bit longer for mine to go away, mm -hmm. you know, because I had a lot. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, I think you, you had, um, you, you had to have um, like something like, um, 320 what they call COVID titers. It's like okay. the, kind of like the, the intensity of the immunity or something. Right. And, uh, and I had 960. So I had a lot of antibodies. And so I gave plasma and they said, come back, you know, so I would come back. I'd go back. That's very good of you. But now I don't know, you know, who knows, you know, Fauci a week ago said, ah, I'm iffy about the plasma thing now. And now of course, you know, big chief know-it-all is like, hey, plasma, I, I make executive order. <laughs> let's, all have pl let's all drink plasma. Yeah, we're going to suck the plasma out of you. Plasma. Such a plasma. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about bet. So let's let's get off the COVID thing because it is enough to make me crazy. Um, okay, but, but so are you still COVID careful? I thought we were getting off. We are, but I had, see, I had, um, COVID. Yeah, like I had, you know, I went for a ride. I went up, I drove up to, uh, met up with my friend Felicia Collins, you know, Felicia mm -hmm. Collins. I do. And, uh, she's, uh, she was in town. She's been living up in Albany, but she was in town. So I went and, uh, I said, I'm going to drive up. And we went and took, walked over to the park and just sat in the park. So, but, you know, we were masked, you know, uh, I have, 
you know, I was staying at my sister's when I was up in the apartment with my sister. I didn't wear, we didn't wear masks and I'm okay. I didn't, I don't have it. I have no symptoms. So we're both okay. I don't have COVID. And so when do you stop being contagious? You said you were going to share that with us because we have Marge who's got COVID right now. When do you stop being contagious? After like, um, it can be like after 10 days. Oh, okay. It, after you start showing symptoms? You're contagious from like two days before you start having symptoms. Mm -hmm. You're contagious from two days before that to 10 days after you show symptoms. Okay. All like right. I, like according, I don't think that you stay contagious for, you know, for your lingering, you know, the long haul stuff. Yeah. 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 All right. You, let's not talk anymore. About that. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that now. So, you know, I, I, I learned some stuff um, that you started playing when you were four. So did your mother play? Is that why she started you so young? Yeah. My mother played and um, she didn't play professionally, but she played. And we grew up, my grandfather, her dad lived with us and uh, he was really into music. And um, so he would take me to, we went to, we actually, my sister and I both, I think I, st I started like maybe a year or two after her. She's two years older than I am, mm -hmm. just shy of two years older than I am. And um, my grandfather would take me on the train to Far Rockaway to see Hetty Spielter. He knew her because she was my mother's teacher uh-huh that and then i took five lessons with her and she died so i've kind of always thought that maybe I <laughs> you killed her <laughs> anyway but just i put her over the top she was like oh. <laughs> anyway, who was this six-year-old and so did you was it something that you were pushed to do or something that you loved to do well um i don't remember initially initially how it all happened you mm -hmm. know just started playing. I know that I had a very good ear and I could sit down and I could just play things on the piano. I don't remember really the very, very beginning, mm -hmm. but I don't remember being pushed. I, I, I practiced. Yeah. I practiced. I practiced enough to get through, to get to my lessons. And so I, I, I didn't really become a practicer, a real practicer until, until I left Oberlin College and came back to New York, and then I then I then I was really interested in what I was in what I was studying. So, um, so I practiced. Loved okay, practice. so uh, that was a question I was going to ask you. So you were in conservatory. So does that mean that they could like kick you out? Like, was it like whiplash? Was it intense? Was it not? No, oh, I, I got in on a classical audition, and um, I had just started writing songs like in my senior year in high school. I never played in rock and roll bands. Um, never. It was crazy. I didn't play in rock and roll bands till after college. And, um, but, uh, it was, it was the first year that the jazz department started, mm -hmm. started getting into jazz to Bill Evans. And, and I was really lucky and I was a performance major. I wasn't trying to be, I wasn't, you know, a compo I wasn't getting a degree in composition or some music oh. ed. I was, a, I was, I knew that I was going to play. That's what I wanted to do. Right. I was fortunate that I had great, the teachers that I auditioned for were the best teachers, were like the um, the master and his protege. Wow. And, and so, so and I had a great audition with them. They made me feel very comfortable. And uh, and I got in there, but I just hated it. I didn't like it at all. So I left after a year. I heard about Sanford Gold from a, a film friend of mine, film editor, a friend of mine. <laughs> And um, I went, I wanted to study with him. And so I came back to New York after a year and studied with him. Did you have that all set up before you left college or you did it on a wing and a, you figured you'd just make it work? No, I, I left, I left college mm -hmm. probably like the summer. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I, and I, and I'm certain when I got home, I got his number and I called him and I started to study, you know, how long did you, how long did you study with him? I stayed with him until he left New York um, from like, from the time I was uh, like 19 until I was, till I was 21. And then he left, he moved, he and his wife, Maxine moved to Florida. Um, but he was, he was the guy for me. He was, he was the first guy for me. He was, he was an older cat. He used to play, he was the, um, he was the music director for the Ed Sullivan uh, orchestra. He was Eartha Kitt's musical director. Wow. 
he was a heavy, he was a really heavy cat and like, you know, was had smoked like three packs of Camel non filters a day and, and drank and did heroin and, you know, and he, you know, he, he doesn't smoke anymore. He lost a lung, and, you know, doesn't drink anymore, but, but he was wild anyway. You know, he smoked joints during my lessons and. <laughs> I gotta love that. So, and, uh, Beth, you hadn't been in rock bands what, and you knew you wanted to play. What was your, what was your initial dream? What, what did you, how did you see yourself? Being a, playing in bands, playing, playing in bands. In, in rock bands? Yeah, playing in rock bands. Yeah. Okay, so uh, even though you had I was starting to get the, I was, you know, I was in, without knowing it, I was getting the influences of Leon Russell and um, uh, I want to say Chuck Lavelle, but there's another one, another guy I'm thinking of, a rock and roll piano, but Nikki Hopkins mm -hmm. and uh, Richard T and Aretha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so my, you know, I was, I was definitely moving into that gospely R and B world, you know, which is, you know, I mean, I think of myself as a, as a, as kind of a gospely rock gospely keyboard player. Your, uh, your cover of Benny and the Jets is uh, legendary. It, it's oh, just, what? it's extraordinary. It really is. I, I watched it. I watched it a lot of times today because it's not just, the way it sounds, it's the way you play. It's watching you play. Um, it's the whole thing. It's the visual. It's the, it, yeah. You, you you have a lot of you have a lot of balls when you play the keyboard, which I really like. Um, and you play a lot of Elton John. I, I I was I've been listening to you all day, and a lot of Elton John. Well, that uh, was that was because that was an Elton John record. That was an Elton John record, right? I, I did three records for this company called Solo Sounds. They were doing, uh, rec they do the, they were doing CDs, one instrument, uh, you know, one instrument CDs of, you know, some, you know, some got maybe the Beatles or um, I know that Lou Soloff did one, he did a record for them on trumpet um, before he passed. Um, I did, they asked me to do Elton John and then they asked me to do the hardest thing I've ever had to do, which was West Side Story. And that was really, really hard. You know, I listened to I Feel Pretty I today. All of, I didn't do all, uh, the, I mean, all of it, but I did, you know, like I did certain, you know, I did. I heard like, I Feel Pretty today. It was great. It's fantastic. Oh, oh, you did? So there yeah. was that, Ryan, uh, Ryan Adams, which I really loved doing because I wasn't familiar with Ryan Adams' music at all. So it's sort of, you know, I, it, it got my feet wet into his stuff, which I really, really enjoyed. And it was fun to play such non-pianistic. It was, I mean, there's like no piano on the re not very many keyboards on the records yet. It was, you know, to have it just be a, a well, all of it is kind of odd, I mean, all interesting to have just a one instrument playing everything except Elton. But even right. that, that is, you know, without a vocal, you know, just playing, you know, playing it as an instrumental is, it's tricky, it's tricky, but you know, I listen, those, those Elton John songs, you know, I heard, I, you know, I lived on them. So I, I love that shit. I grew up on that. Uh, a good friend of mine, Adam Chester is the surrogate Elton John. He's the one who does, he stands in for Elton whenever he's at rehearsal or whatever. And he's played my living room a few times. Adam's, okay. yeah, he's, he's a kick. So yeah, well, sorry, Elton is. So we get a lot of infusion of Elton. He's actually been doing these quarantini concerts and raising money for charity, which is lovely. He's out in the street playing Elton and stuff. Oh, good. Yeah. Good yeah. So, so, Beth, so did you ever have to have a real job? I had a real job when I was 16. I yeah. was a waitress in an Italian restaurant in Hewlett. And um, I had a real job when I moved into the city. When I first moved into town, I worked like uh, like two day, two or three days a week at a at a restaurant on the east side called Hobos. Called what? Hobos. I remember Hobos. Okay, well, <laughs> Lou's my my dear Lou Soloff. It's really funny because. Lou lived around right near there and he used to come in for brunch every weekend, you know, and he, we met, I think we met 
I don't know if we met there. I think we might have met there. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden later on, you know, we're like seeing each other all the time and blah, blah, blah. And, and he would always, in, for, for years, he would introduce me as a, I know her since she was waitressing at Hobo's. I'm like, Luke, what is your career? Can we get, yeah, can you over, move? Can we get over my ability to serve you bacon and eggs? On <laughs> That's we made girl. a lot of together too, buddy. <laughs> Okay, Beth, so how did, how did, uh, that's not a lot of, of gigs to have to have in the real I, world. I, I've, I have been a, um, I have been a working musician since I'm 19 years old. Okay, so what was the first working musician gig you got? At Home Bar on 91st and 2nd. Okay. Kenny Gorka, who later took over, you know, was there. Kenny was up at the Home Bar. And Kenny, oh. oh wait, I have, I have no wait. This is my first. That is not my first gig. My first gig okay. was a year prior. Then you're gonna love this story. My first yeah. gig was a year prior to that, and it was when I was living before I moved into the city. I I lived at my I, after college. It, there was one year between moving. In, I was 19 when I moved into town. So mm -hmm. that my 18 year that that year I was living home. And so these friends of mine knew Tony Iadenza at the time. Tony Danza. His real name oh. is oh, Iadenza. I'm like, who is that? Okay. Tony had a wine and cheese bar in Malvern, Long Island, where he grew up. Wow. And he gave me my first job playing and singing in a bar. That was my first job. Um, but my oh. first job when I moved into town was at was at home. Kenny Gorka. Um, hired me to play like during dinner, like before the band started, I would just, I would play. And then, you know. Wait, did you do standards? Did you do rock and roll? What were you doing during dinner? What was dinner music? Uh, I'm sure I played like Bonnie Raitt songs and mm -hmm. Linda Ronstadt and, and um, Jackson Brett, Neil Young, probably. I probably played like, you know, Sunday Kind of Love, you know. We you playing? What's that? Were you singing? I was. Uh huh. I was. Yeah. I was singing, mm -hmm. and then you know, and because I I was playing there all the time, I ended up meeting. I mean, that was that was one of the places back in the seventies. That's where like Elephant's Memory hung out. That was like their their place, mm -hmm. and so they used to have you know music in the window. You know, Stan Bronstein was the band leader at my wedding. Was he really? Yes. Did he pass recently? Uh, I, I think I heard that he passed. Um, I think I heard he passed a couple of A few ago. years ago, actually, I think. Yeah. Maybe. But um, yeah. I, you know, friends with Stan, I was friends with mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. A little too friendly with some of them, but <laughs> those were 20s, what can I say? <laughs> okay, so, so you're playing up there, and then... Uh, so what happened? You're making a living doing it. You're making enough to, to pay your, your rent and stuff. So when I was working there, I was at that point, I was working at oh, Hopes. Hopes. But okay. I also, um, I had, you know, I was studying with Sanford Gold mm -hmm. and um, I got a job teaching. A woman from a music school in Tarrytown wanted to, um, wanted Sanford Gold's method. He wanted okay. Sanford, Sanford Gold, obviously couldn't do it, but he wanted somebody. Sanford Gold wrote a book, and uh, it's a great book, and, uh, you know, just a method of teaching and of learning. And, and so they wanted that method, and so he threw me to the wolves at a very young age, at 19, <laughs> threw me to the wolves. And it was a less than um, enjoyable experience for me. Oh, oh. It was it was not good. It was like I wasn't mature enough to appreciate the fact that in, that what what the teacher did was she kept the student the good students for herself. These are all these are private students, the private school. So there's always this. So she would keep the student the good players to herself, and like I seem to get the the either they were not very good or they were actually impaired. You know, God bless, God bless them. You know, um, oh, wow. 
they were not, you know. Yeah, challenging. They were challenged. So it was, you know, it wasn't, it was less musical than I, you know, than I <laughs> it to be. How, how long did you do that? Not very long. Maybe I did it for a year. Uh-huh. And, um, and then I went on tour. No, no. I went... Then I, I, no, 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 no. I think that somewhere in there, I don't remember now if it's before or after, I went on tour. I got a call from my friend, Lou, this guy, Lou Falcino, who was in the boxing promotion business. And one of his people owed him money. One of his, you know, one of the people owed him money. And so he, they, so they gave him a bus and truck tour of Godspell <laughs> as payment. So their musical director was quitting. Like, uh -huh. they, somebody by the weekend. And so um, my fr a friend of mine from college was working for him and uh, said, you know, I know somebody who plays piano. And so he says, who is it? And they called me and I met him at the airport and, uh, and the rest is history. You know, I got the gig. And so that's your first musical directing gig? Yeah. Were you, was that intimidating to, to jump into that? With, or did you feel prepared? No, I don't think I felt intimidated by it. Excellent. I think I was, uh, you know, I learned the music pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I was, it was, it was, it, it was mostly fun and then mm -hmm. horrifying. <laughs> so you, and you've done quite a bit of theater and you've done Broadway. Not really. I have not done a lot of theater at all. I mean, I, I did. Right. You did Leader of the Pack, Godspell, Waitress. You did the original Color Purple. Alan Willis was a great friend of mine, and I saw that you. No, I did the. I, I was subbed on the original Color Purple. Okay. But I subbed in the piano chair, because Joseph Jobert, who who was the piano piano chair, mm -hmm. um, it was the most incredible band. I had. The, I'm. I'm Brenda Russell is one of my mm -hmm. dearest friends as well. So she and Allie were, you know, collaborated. She and Allie and Stephen Bray wrote the music and she didn't have anything to do with it. She didn't know. I called her one day. I said, guess what I'm doing tomorrow. Anyway, wow. uh, it was just, and when Joe Jaber, when the, when the conductor, Linda was out, Joe would jump up and conduct and I would, I would play. So, uh, that was, you know, that music was right up my alley. It was pop gospel. It was just the most fun. And the band was killer. And I had a great time playing it. I had a really great time playing that show. Um, it was one, I had had a, it was actually a, a, a project that I did. I had major back surgery. That was 12 years ago. And I had oh, wow. major, major back surgery. And that was my recovery project. I stayed home and I had the, they got me the DVD and everything of the conductor and the music. And I just learned the music. And then uh, once I was able to uh, function in the real world, I was able to go in and play. So it was really good. It was really an accident or was this like a long time? No, it was just a many years. It's not important to talk about. It was bad. Okay. So, okay. So, so you started out on a touring company of Godspell and so you're making a living now. You don't have to work in a restaurant anymore. No. You come back and, and, and what happens after that? Started playing in a lot of, with, a, with, a, you know, a, a ton of singer songwriters. You know, and they would, you know, they would pay me before they would, you know, feed themselves. They would pay, the, you know, the bands, you know, our silly $60 or $75, you know. Um, but I played with a ton of them. You know, I'd go from some nights I'd play to I'd have a couple of gigs. And um, I just, I started playing um, with, because I had, I started playing in, um, with, I just started playing with a lot of different kind of different kind of artists, you know, uh, some actually pop artists, some R and B artists. Because I was working with also, I was working with my friend Yogi Horton, and when uh, do you, did you know Yogi Horton? He was a no, before. but Yogi and David Wooford, who is a bass player that lives in New Jersey, we would we would go on gigs together, and they would pick me. They both had Volkswagen Beetles, and they would pick me up in my apartment. And I would put my, I had a suitcase Rhodes and I'd put part of it in one of them, <laughs> the bottom in one, the top in the other. And the three of us would go like a little merry rhythm section and you know, go out in the town playing. 
but it was it was like you know I, I it was every night i mean the, in those days back in the 70s and the 80s the clubs were oh. the club scene was crazy i mean i feel you know i feel blessed that I grew up in the time I came here in the time that I did. So I'm not really upset about the age I am because if I wasn't this age, I wouldn't have come up in New York City at, you know, at the best time, the most rockinest time in New York, I think for me, for music, live music. Absolutely. Absolutely. There was, you know, Mikkel's. I mean, I lived at the time with my boyfriend up the block from Mikkel's on 97th in Central Park West. And, you know, I would play in all these clubs in the village and in Soho and I mean, but there were a ton of clubs on the Upper East Side as well as, you know, Kenny's Castaways and the Bitter End. What was it called before the Bitter End? It was the Bitter something, Bitter. And, well, the the other end the other was what I ended up being the Rock and Roll Cafe. The other end turned into the Rock and Roll Cafe, which was in the mid eighties, which is when I was booking it. Where was that? That was the, uh, the old other end, which was two doors away from the Bitter End. It's now something called like something Willie's or something. But um, but I saw Carly Simon at the other end in like 1971. And uh, yeah, it was crazy times. It, it was cra music. Was so crazy. Much crazy. I mean, you know, to the, the ability to go to McKell's and, and walk into McKell's and you never know, like any night, Shock is going to be there. The best musicians in town are there. The best drugs are there. Oh, best right. There, James Baldwin was there. I mean, that place was so. Did you ever go there? I never went to. You know, I was in Arizona. I went to college in Tucson, so I was not in New York in the seventies. I came back in the eighties. Oh well, this was you know this was the eighties. This was the eighties. I'm talking like from eighty to eighty five because um, my my memory of Mikkel's there of Mikkel's just going there all the time because I lived up the street and playing there. Also, I had started playing with Sissy Houston in the early 80s, so. Okay, so so what was your first, I wanted to get to that. So yeah, I didn't start music till 86 is when I started. I was a actress and a comedian and stuff before then, so I wasn't. Really? In, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, oh my God. So uh, did you know that, my, did you know Gabe Abelson, did you know my husband was the, uh, was Letterman's head monologue writer for a, a bunch of years? And Gabe Abelson. Um, he, he took Bill Sheff's job for like a period of almost five years. Uh, and I knew him. Yeah, I'm sure you did. I played there, you know, a few times a year. Yep. I played, I played on a lot for, for many years. Um, okay. So, so when did it go from being, okay, a, a singer songwriter here, a singer, so when to playing with everybody to getting like the coveted gig was Whitney Houston, your first coveted gig. Was that? Well, um, I played with Sissy Houston. Well, you, I mean, I meant Sissy. So you played with Sissy first. I played with Sissy first. How did you get that gig? This, that's another great story. Okay. Uh, my boyfriend that I was living on 97th in Central Park with. Okay. Car player, and her. Of course. And her musical director. Now I, I, and I sort of went to move to drummers. By the way. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so he was her musical director, but he was not, you know, he basically, he was a very minimally talented musician. He was a songwriter. He, he was part of Love Zager. He wrote for them for many years. He was on staff there and he was a functional, you know, R and B guitar player, you know, mm -hmm. rhythm guitar player, not a great player by any means and, mm -hmm. and not a great chart writer. And so but I used to go to all the gigs because I was in love with him. I loved him and I used to go to all the gigs and I'm certain that Sissy would have see, had seen me a million times, but she would have walked right by me on the street. Uh -huh. in fact, well, what, what year are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about, I want to say 81 or 82. Uh-huh. 81 or 82, I think okay. I said. Uh-huh. And uh, um, so she's playing down at uh, the 7th Avenue South, upstairs at 7th Avenue South. Mm -hmm. And it was packed. And she wasn't doing it. She didn't have a drummer. She had a percussionist. 
a bass player and a guitar player. Okay. And a, and a piano player, but no drummer. And uh, no, maybe she did have a drummer. Um, I know it was a very, it was kind of small, so she hated, she hated drums. You know, this was, this would have been too loud for her. <laughs> um, so she's waiting, waiting, waiting. The, the uh, piano player doesn't, it's late. Yeah. Not real churchy, really, I mean, a great player, real, real legit church, you know, church player. And um, so he doesn't show up. And so at one point she finally, she says, well, you know, they didn't pay to come hear him. So they pay to come see me. So I'm going to go out there. So she goes out there with just Frank on a lame guitar player, <laughs> the only chordal instrument up there at this point. <laughs> Mind yeah. you, uh -huh. bass player and drummer. So, so they say. So they play one song, and it was kind of a disaster. It was kind of lame. It was pretty lame. Um, everybody loved it, loved Sissy, but it was pretty lame. And so their guys are saying to her, to Sissy, "Get bet up here, get bet up here," and she's like, "Who? Who?" I told you she had no. I was like to her, I was like the drunken girlfriend. <laughs> Around. So they played another song, Bad, and they said, Sissy, really trust us. Get Bet up here. And so she says, All right, this it's show business. Come on, Bet. <laughs> so um I went up and she we, we did the two of us, which I had heard them do a million times. I didn't need music for it. I you know, I, I knew I play it by ear. And so so we played it, you know, finally it was a, there was a groove and, you know, I so, took a solo and it was grooving and blah, blah, blah. And um, eventually he came and nearly pushed me off the piano bench when he got there. And after the show, Sissy called me back to her dressing room and she was like, thank you so much. You were fantastic. I loved playing with you. Um, I really hope we get to do it again. And I think the following weekend, John, the piano player, was in church and I think fell off the church bench playing, oh. fell, broke his wrist, and the gig was mine. This is like a Rosemary's Baby story. <laughs> was, was there a little doll with John on it in your house somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was just meant to be. So that was meant to be, and you know that's how I met Wit, and you know she and Gary sang sang backgrounds in the group, and so you know we had a we had a, we hit it off great. We you know we got to be buds, and we hung out, and you know they'd come over to the house, not Gary so much, but Whitney mm -hmm. and Robin, and um, yeah. So, but like from we used to play a lot at we used to play all over town. So when you're playing all over town, a lot of people see you play. It's like now like. You know, I'm basically, you know, I'm planning my funeral at this point <laughs> because there, nobody is thinking about me at all right now. Nobody. Well, that, that's not true. Nobody's thinking about anybody. Everybody's thinking about the idiot and COVID. I mean, that's what else are we thinking about right now? I shouldn't say that because uh, um, that's not true. Yes, of course. It's I'm, not true. I'm disparaging myself. Yeah. But, um, but I also, we played at Sweetwater's a lot, which was a club on Amsterdam mm -hmm. Avenue in like mm -hmm. the 60s, mm -hmm. a supper club. It was mm -hmm. an R&B supper club, a legitimate R&B supper club, but like a real restaurant, not like, right. like you know, like the bottom line. <laughs> and, Cuisine. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, you know, fried chicken. And no, this was like, yeah. you know, the food. Sorry, Alan, if you're watching. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so yeah, so we how sad is that that it's gone? How crazy is it that the bottom line is gone? That's just That's, devastating. That was the worst one. That that oh, was the worst. really bad. That was really. Uh, I, I was like uh, my home away from home. I played so many shows there, with you know some theatrical pro projects, mm. um, but um, not you know. But it was it was. I played there with a lot of different people. It was a great club, and I had a great relationship with Alan Pepper and. And Stanley and and um, yeah, that was a real loss. Where were we? We digress. Where were we? We were talking about um, we were getting back to 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 Whitney. To the club, oh, the Sweetwater. 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 I mean, I played all over town. 
Mm-hmm. Sweetwater. So I met like I met Sarah Dash. Sarah Dash mm-hmm. hired me to be her musical director, and I played. So I played with her for a while. Esther Marrow, another gospel singer, great gospel singer, mm-hmm. hired me to be her musical director. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked a bit with Peggy Blue. Um, so I worked in that club a lot because that was the cl- that was besides um, Seventh Avenue South and uh, McHale's, That was really like that was a gospel R and B club. You know, and rock- that, are you making like money that you can? It, you're, you're obviously sustaining yourself and you're living off of it. Uh, 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 are you doing well? I, I mean, I'm, I, I always did okay. I mean, I wasn't doing as well as I did when I started going on big tours. Right. But, uh, you know, I mean, I didn't need another job. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. That's doing well. So I was, you know, I, I was doing okay. And, um, yeah, I made a living. I, I always made a living. Mm-hmm. And um, did this make your your mother happy? Um, that's so interesting. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, of course it did. It made her happy. Mm-hmm. It made her very happy. I'm going to choose the high road right now. Okay, very good. It made her. She was she was extremely proud of you know she got to see some of my accomplishments. My father unfortunately did not. Mm-hmm. he died i mean he saw me he saw me playing with um sissy and patty lapone um and rock no he we, he never saw me play with raquel welsh he'd passed when i started oh. oh. he died and then i, I didn't started. know raquel welsh was on your resume i didn't see raquel there there was one of the pictures that i sent you there's a picture <laughs> of raquel she's wearing a pink cat suit and I'm at the piano. I'm about this big, and oh, um, it was a uh, yes. I I was I was I was Raquel's musical director for a minute. I okay, did. now was she like the most? She was the most gorgeous woman like ever. Stunning. stunning. Go back to when you when we finish. Go back to that. Um, I will. I'm going to go look. Um, st- she was stunning. Mm-hmm. And you know, God, she sing? was she what? Could she sing? No. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> okay. No, she was terrible. But she had, but she and her husband at the time hired Roy Bennett, who was like at the time was like the hottest set designer. He did all of pr- Prince always. I mean, he did all wow. the. Heavy, he did uh-huh. a lot of the heavy, uh, big, big shows. And um, so she. I just remember Raquel did Broadway. She did uh, like a major show on Broadway. She walked into right, didn't she? She did. I don't know. Yeah, she did like like Mame or something, but like not Mame. She did something huge on Broadway. She did. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. Told- she did. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, she was terrible. But she and then she had and she had Brian Ruggles. Mm-hmm. Doing front of house sound, who has been Billy Joel's front of house sound man forever, mm-hmm. and um, Pat Morrow, who was Michael Jackson's tour manager, you know, and this rock and roll band. She had me, this what? Paul Jacobs was on synth, um, Ivan Elias, bless his rest his rest his soul on bass, Andy Newmark. I knew Ivan mm-hmm. until he just wouldn't play it the same every night. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was quite, it was quite a high end production, but we played for like, you know, we went to Miami and we like played, like we, we played like these, like these, I forget where, where exactly we played, but it was, I mean, these are subscription theaters. These are old, there's, there's like Walker gridlock and like, a, they, just, <laughs> they know what's coming at them now. Or, or Walker they, gridlock. They, yeah. they, <laughs> big river people but um you know it was it was a it was a clean show it just was she's just not very good okay all right so after raquel what uh where'd you uh, go from raquel patty you know i started working with patty lapone well that is a horse of a completely different color yes that's like going from this to crazy yeah 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 
Um, how was she to work with personality wise? Um, we, we got on great. Um, she actually, I met her before I started to play with her. I actually sang backgrounds for her. Uh, nice. She did a show at the Bitter End. My friend David Nickturn, mm -hmm. who I, he used to call, he used to call me a lot those in the old day, those days, like early 80s. He used to call me to sing a lot. He really, he, he knew me as a singer. Wow, I love that. Which is, yeah, there's a few people that, that like never called me to play, but called me, called me to sing. I love it. Well, I he I've heard you sing. You're a wonderful singer. So well, I get it. You. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so David Nick turned to produce a record with Patty. I'm oh, sorry, somebody just said it. It was Woman of the Year. Raquel was Woman of the Year. That was her show. Oh, oh, thank okay. you. Thank you, whoever that is. Ed, thank you. Okay. Woman of the Year. Yeah. Um, so uh, where was I? Patty Lapone. Yes. Oh, Patty. She did a show. So she was doing a record and she was looking, they were looking for material. And I was, you know, I used to be a songwriter. I used to write, you know, not like, not like songwriters who don't have a career playing an instrument, but I was a songwriter. I wrote a lot, you know, I wrote songs. Right. Not, not as many as I wish I had, but, you know, I, but I did, you know, I did what I did. So I wrote, I had written this song. I was writing with um, a guy named Jay Hirsch, great songwriter. And we wrote a song called Like Dominoes and she loved it. And um, so I, she did that song on her record. And so, so she had me come and sing backgrounds on her show. And then, um, you know, one thing led to another and um, I became her piano player and then I became her musical director. Now, is this around Evita time? Oh, this is like when she's huge, right? This is after Evita. This is, uh, this is post Evita. But she's, but that made her huge. Oh yeah, she was yeah. huge. Huge. She was yeah. huge. She, uh, she had already, I think she had already done, had she done like Les Mis already maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember when that first when that first premiered, but I remember we used to play some of the, some material from that show. So, um, yeah, so that was Patty, and you know, and I and I was doing a lot of. I started recording and doing jingles and recording sessions, records in town. You know, singing on playing on jingles, singing on jingles. Then I started writing jingles and producing. So I got really into jingles for a while. So that is that how you and Will became such good friends? No, Will and I became good friends. We became friends before any of this. That Will and I became friends when I was, you know, a wild 20 something. And uh, uh, Will leaves, who I'm talking about, by the way, to everybody out there. Yeah. And so we just, you know, we became friends and, you know, and he also played with Patty. Ah, okay. At one point, he played with Patty. He and Will and Steve Ferrone. Oh my God! Played. We did. I remember we did. Uh, we played Atlantic City, and uh, that was so much goddamn fun. <laughs> damn fun. Um, I remember I bought a dress for to wear during for the show. It was like this beautiful vintage dress, and then I played blackjack afterwards and made the dress back. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> remember just <laughs> nice. That phrase is like you know lingers in my head. <laughs> But I don't know that I, you know, there were those little spotty things back then in the days and, and, you know, we just, and I did, you know, and then Letterman a lot, did Letterman. And then he played, you know, he, I played on some things that he was producing and he would call me. And then I, a Di Diane Scanlon and I had a band for many years, the Scanlon Sussman band in the eighties. We started that like in the, like 83. So this is all going on at like the same time. You know, Sissy, I mean, Sissy wasn't, I mean, I worked a lot. She worked a lot in those days, but uh -huh. that was not my only gig. You know, right. I wasn't making a living by just playing with one person. I right. Was playing with, you know, a lot of people. So, um, but like, I remember uh, Will played on one of our records. Well, we didn't make records. We just recorded songs and, you know, played live. Um, but that's how Will and I, you know, we just, we've just been like, Thick as thieves for many, many years. Love him to tears. Yeah, he's a pretty and, and it, I became, you know, besties with Sandrine. So, you know, she's one of my dearest friends as well. So life goes on. <laughs> Everybody, I have a lot of, I have a lot of friends. Like my best friend, 
I, I'm st I'm friendly with the girl that I grew up living next door to when since we were three years old. I love that. Yeah. And like if you would go to a birthday party of mine, you would see a lot of the same people that were at my birthday party 25 years ago, mm -hmm. 30 years ago. I love that. I'm still friends with a lot. I mean, I have a bunch of new people in my life, but right. I'm still have a lot of the old crew in my life, so which I cherish, which is kind you're, of you're a Scorpio, aren't you? I am. As am I. That, that's a kind of a trait of the Scorpios. Oh yeah. When yeah. Well, I'm the 29th of October. I'm the 24th. Yeah. We'll so. have a little celebration somewhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so if we ever get to do that again. Oh God. Anyway. Uh, okay. So so I met you 86 ish. You were playing with the Contis, and I want to say, and I've been trying all day to think of the name of the place. It was Acme. right there. Under Acme? Thank you. I could not think of it all day. It was driving me crazy. They had really good fried oysters there, too. But anyway. The food was upstairs, and then yep. downstairs was, the, was the, you know, where everything went to shit. <laughs> the jam the jam back in those days, yeah. Jeff Kent. Do you remember Jeff Kent? I know the name, but I don't remember the person. He kind of led the jam, I think, maybe sometimes. Yeah, but I used to play down there with Steve and John a lot. I'm still, I'm still, I, I mean, I speak to Johnny, you know, whenever I can. And I try and, you know, get on gigs with him and get him on shit that I can get on. Um, same with Steve. But, you know, Steve and I, we, we've done more stuff together. But, yeah, I sort of, John and I kind of lost each other somewhere in the middle. I, you know, I keep seeing things like I see him on, I saw a picture of him with Billy Joel. I had no idea that he even did a tour with Billy Joel. So, I, I didn't know that now. And I've known Tommy Burns forever. You know, Tommy and all those lunatics. Yeah. But, um, but Liberty just did my show a uh, couple weeks. I love Liberty so much. I, I got to play with Lib finally um, with Ronnie Spector a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. We did a, uh, actually I played with him last year too for, uh, I did this thing for Will, that Will Music Directs, this, uh, uh, it's a, it's for the kids. It's right, for the kids. It's Liberty, the, he does the kids thing. So yeah, Liberty was the drummer on that, on the kids thing. And so was, was Ricky Bird on that one too? No. Okay. Oh, no, it was this um, it, Italian guitar player. I think hmm. the Italian guitar player was great. He was really good. Okay, so so how so Sissy, you're playing mostly in New York. You're not traveling with Sissy. No, we traveled. We went to we we traveled. We went to Chicago. We played in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We traveled a bit. Mm -hmm. We traveled a bit. And so was was uh, was Whitney the first like mega? No. Who was Michael Franks? Okay. Was the first like um, to musical touring? band I think that I I think it was Michael Franks it was like in the late 70s I went on tour with Michael so as what was that like for you as a player as a keyboard player. well that was I, I adore Michael and I go but now Michael calls me once in a while to go to sing with him to sing backups with him and there's a, he does a couple of duets one that he did with Brenda Russell mm -hmm. um and when I when I give my love to you and so uh so I, I sing some duets with him and that's fun Fun, weird not to be playing, but Charles Blenzig is the piano player, and he's he does a bang up job. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's uh, it's. I, I just like the fact that I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm still here. You, you know, are still here. I'm here, still doing it. You know. We have to talk about some of these women that you've played with that are so extraordinary. So, so you had a, a close friendship with Whitney, aside from being her musical director, or you weren't. With Whitney. No, I did, I, I music directed a couple of gigs with Whitney after she got signed, but before she put her touring band together, she had me help her out. And, you know, I, I put some bands together for her for a couple of different gigs. So I was her musical director, like in that interim, that interim period. Um, but, no, I was never her musical director. And you, you're on that iconic "I Will Always Love You." You, you you're that you're on. That's you. That yeah. is, wow. The so, only the only record of hers that I played on. It was a good one to. It was a good one to do. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, the whole that's the same. I think the whole band is is the same. It's like we all, you know, her producers all had their thing and their team, and you know, so we didn't we didn't we we played live. I but mean, had, how, how crazy was so, that to be on a record that sold a gazillion copies? I probably would be able to give you more of a. Um, a story about it if I was getting royalties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm not. So, yeah. Um, so it was, you know, I did it and it was great. And, you know, when I hear it on the radio and I hear, da, 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 I'm going, oh, great. That's me. That's fine. Okay, great. That and, tw that and 275 would get me on the train. So. <laughs> yeah. So, how, so w you were you with Whitney through the years that her life was troubled? I was with Whitney for the good years. Nice. I was with Whitney from 88 to 99. That's a long time. Yeah. Wow. We toured, I toured with her for a long time. And uh, yeah, we did, a, we toured a couple of records, th three or four records. And we did a couple of amazing HBO shows. You know, we, we went to South Africa. That was amazing. That was an amazing trip. Um, What's the biggest gig you've ever done? Like the biggest audience you've ever played for like the like Wembley State or like what's the biggest thing in South what? Africa wow in South Africa, there was you know there were 75,000 people there oh wait a minute what am I saying we with Whitney we played we it's probably more like over 100,000 because we did play a uh what's the uh, soccer what's the big um thing with soccer at the end of the year that the, the, the cup Whatever the cup is, I, I don't know. I don't follow soccer, but I know. Yeah, it's a big the, that it's a big deal. Okay, it's, it's like the the big, World Cup, isn't it? The World Cup? No, no I don't know. World Cup? I don't know. Cup soccer could be. I don't know. Look at yeah. us. Anyway, um, God, we're such we're such a soccer. <laughs> we're such girls. <laughs> um, no, we can. You don't want to talk tennis? I got it all for you. With tennis. I'm a yeah. tennis. Junkie. Jimmy Connors, the whole story in my book, but that's another story. Anyway, um, so we played at one at one of the we're, let's call it the World Cup now. Is one okay. of you here? Anybody chiming in? Somebody, on that? It's the World Cup. Somebody just said yes. Okay. Yeah. So we played we played the World Cup, and there was you know that was like a lot of people. A lot <laughs> were, of people. There were like over a hundred thousand people there for that. Definitely a lot of people for that. Did it, what, what's what what have you done that has tripped you? You know that I you know that I'd rather play you know in a room with fifty people. Well, that's why my living room is so popular. I w I wish you were out here to play my living room, and who knows when anyone will ever be playing my living room again. Oh, yeah. but so but what about like the first time playing Madison Square Garden? That has to be thrilling. No, it was thrilling. It was thrilling for me. It was thrilling. Radio City was thrilling. Yes. You know, it was it was thrilling. I mean, it was my career has been fairly thrilling. Very thrilling. I, I, I can't, you know, I mean, I went right from Whitney to Bette Midler and I did Bette Midler for also 11 and a half years. OK, so how did how did. OK, so you and Whitney were friends because you started out with Sissy. So right. you had a personal relationship before you started playing together. Yeah, but we, I mean, we weren't like close. We didn't talk on the yeah. phone day or anything like that. But, you know, we were. You know, we were more friendly than, say, a musician that was just hired that she had never met before. You know? Right. And so then, how did you how did you get the bet gig? Um, Mark Shame uh, Bet had come to t called Mark Shaman, who has been her mm -hmm. was her musical director, and um, she, well, no, I mean she had, had another band. She had had another band. Um, she anyway, she called Mark Shaman for a musical director, and she says uh, it was right after the earthquake in '95. Uh, not four, I think. Ninety, whatever four. that big, yeah. Birth, the big, the big. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, so she had an apartment built, and and then she was moving back to New York because she was, didn't want to live in LA full time anymore. She mm -hmm. was rattled, mm -hmm. as many people were. Mm -hmm. So um, he so he said, "Call Pet Sussman." So she called me, and you know, it turns out that. We we have so many things in common besides just our first name. Um, I'm on 94th Street on the west side. She's on 94th Street on the east side. <laughs> um, we both have sisters named Susan. 
Okay, that's weird. My first gig with her was one of her Hulu, Huluween. You know, she does yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. party every year to raise money for a New York Restoration Project. And um, at the end of the gig, we go into the green room after to, you know, hang out and everything. And I get an, I, they hand me an envelope. I pay. And on the envelope, it said Sussman and Associates. I'm like, well, dig that. They already have envelopes with my name on it. So like I'm Beth Sussman and my band is called and Associates. <laughs> so it turns out that her accountant is Sussman. Hysterical. And so there was a lot there was a lot of junk. So we, you know, we did really good for a long time. What was were you friend? Did, was that we, we were we were very good friends. We had become we became very good friends. I mean, you know, you get a little bit older and you're a woman, and you, you know, it's, I think it's, you know, you meet a woman who's, you know, strong, and we just got along, you know, mutual respect, and um, she was jealous of me. She was jealous of my life just because I was so happy all the time. I was already always going out and she's like, wait, you always, well, you never call me. Why are you always going? <laughs> but, um, uh, did you have any of that in your career? Did Because strong women working together can go the other way because we're not encouraged to be supportive of each other and to not, we are encouraged to be jealous and petty, I think. Well, I think, I think that, I think that the, the real ones mm -hmm. want somebody, they don't want yes people with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the same thing with Raquel. I mean, Raquel and I became buddies. I got Raquel to join the Paris Health Club. <laughs> I started with my trainer, <laughs> naked steams with Raquel Welch. Okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. There are a lot of people right now who are very jealous of that. That was really embarrassing. I mean, I, I, who gets, who's taking a, who's taking a shower with, I mean, a, a steam with, anyway. Oh, um, okay. So, so, so bet. So how about working with Cher? What was that like for you? I just, Cher, I did, well, I did a record with Cher, uh -huh. I did, which I have here somewhere. That, that was a gold record. Um, and that was, a, I did, I played on the tracks that uh, Desmond Child produced that record. And um, Desmond and I were friends. I had played on a Desmond Child and Rouge album back in the 70s. And I was friends with them back in the 70s from playing in JPs and clubs and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, God, there's so many, you know, there was so, there's so much intertwining, you know, through the years. Because I came back in full circle and started playing with Desmond again. Like, you know, Desmond, I did a couple of shows with Desmond. I did a show at the Kate up in Connecticut. We did a show last year, last February, in, uh, at Lincoln C Jazz at Lincoln Center, um, part of the um, the songbook, the uh, American, Great American Songbook series that mm -hmm. they do. And um, anyway, I digressed again. That's all right. Di those, these, these are all good. Uh, we were talking about Cher. Cher. So I did a... So I, I, uh, um, I did a record with her. I remember I was actually, I was up, do, I was doing a gig with Lapone at the, um, at the, at the, uh, Grossinger's. Wow. Grossinger's. And, and after the show and the, and the next day I drove to, to Bearsville. Bearsville is a, was a famous, uh, recording studio up in Woodstock, which where they were recording this record. And so I went up there and I, I, I played on bet on Cher's record up there, and that was about it. And then I went on, um, and then I went on tour with her when I was uh, back in 2013, 2013 to 2015. Um, well, no, I think it was the second tour that we did with Cher um, with Cindy when I was playing with Cindy Lauper. We opened up for Cher. I mean, you've you've played with so many iconic women, and. Yeah. Without naming names, was there anybody who that that wasn't fun? Was it ever not fun? Um, generally speaking, when it when it stopped fun, I walk, I leave, and I and I've never I've never quit. I've never I've never 
quit or been or been fired really except for i got fired from a restaurant once i was playing and singing in a french restaurant down in the village and the only um french song i knew was prayer jaca <laughs> in my in my <laughs> playing but no no can do I, I was wrong i was wrong vicky i was wrong they fired me <laughs> Frere Jaca, that's a good one. I like it. Um, but okay, so wait, I'm just remembering that. But when at the very beginning, did you was Tim Curry one of the first people that you played with? Oh yeah. Um, How did that happen? Tim Curry. I guess Tim Curry was after Michael Franks. Yeah, I think it must have been after Michael Franks. Um, I was playing at JP's one night mm -hmm. and Dick Wagner walked in. Now Dick Wagner was, he, he like was a guitar team with Steve Hunter. They played with Lou Reed. Uh, they played with um, Alice Cooper um, together. Uh, Dick wrote uh, You and Me and Only Women Bleed. He wrote a lot mm -hmm. of Schools Out for Summer. He wrote a lot of stuff mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Alice. And, um, Anyway, he walked in and he heard me and we started to talk and he really liked me and liked my playing. And we sort of started to um, have a little romance and, you know, and he said, I want you to play on this record. You know, he, I'm producing and co-producing with Michael, K Michael Kamen, uh, this Tim Curry record. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Tim Curry? Isn't he an actor? And they go, he's, he's actually kind of an interesting singer and he writes really interesting lyrics. And he's a rocker, really. He was. He was mm -hmm. just. He was wild. I and, bet. Uh, so you know that was a, that was a little era of of my life right there. That whole era of Tim Dick Wagner, well Tim Curry um, making that record and then going on tour with that record um, was amazing. I went on. It was with Bob Babbitt and uh, Charles Collins. Bob Babbitt, mm -hmm. famous bass player, Philly bass player, mm -hmm. very famous guy. Mm -hmm. And Charles Collins, another Philly great, great, great drummer, and Michael Chudin on keyboards. And, and who played drums? I don't remember who played drums now. Um, Bob Kulick played with us too. He was on tour with us too. I and just saw. Him. And by the way, my, uh, my, my, yes, Bob passed. Who am I thinking of? It'll come to me, but I, it just sparked. Mike Lang got on my, wrote me a little note today. Beth Sussman, and he was all excited that. Um, Michael Lang, Woodstock. Michael Lang. Michael oh. Lang, a keyboard, the composer. Oh, oh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mike, not Woodstock. Michael Lang. Oh, no. That's... Mike Lang, composer. Mike Lang, gazillions of scores and. Yes, of course, of mm -hmm. course. Um. I'm so so wait so somebody's asking if the share record you played on was um closer to the truth is that the album that you were on no it's this one it's this one she pulls it out it's this one it's called um, Cher. Uh, Tony's saying uh bob kulik was with pepe castro uh, it's called share well, oh my God, look at that thing. It's, called, it's just called Share. And I played on um, Streets of Little Italy and Maine and um, Maine Man or something like that. I played on a couple of tracks on that. Very cool. Um, so, and, and when did you play with Cindy? Like, I know so many people that played with Cindy on and off through the years, like Kevin I, Jenkins and. Yeah. And, what 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 era were you? I did the uh, 30th anniversary of the She's So Unusual record, that tour. So when so was that? I, that was in 13 through 13 through 15. Okay, more recently. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah yeah yeah. This in this decade, yeah, 13 through 15, and uh and we went everywhere. We went to, we went all over. We we did you know we did states. We did Japan. We did Australia. We had a good we had a good time. I had a good time with her. We got we got along well. I mean, you know, she's cuckoo, but we got along well. I uh, Cindy and I were at a 
thing for our kids trying out for preschool. I mean, it was like a million years ago. My son's 26, but we were sitting there, you know, trying to get our, our kids into like a she, she free. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So, um, so Martin Short, how does Martin Short, I, I love Martin. Martin but how does who, um, Paul Schaefer called me one day as, you know, he's a dear, dear one to me. And I've done a lot of work with him a ton through the years. Mm -hmm. And he said, Bet, I've got a proposition for you. <laughs> he said, I, I do this gig every year. It's um, Toys R Us has this benefit every year, their big gala. And Marty Short is the host. He, he's the host. And um, and I'm the musical director. Mm -hmm. and, and it's wonderful. I have a little band and everything. And, you know, last year I did it, but I had to get somebody else to do the the charts and everything. It was, uh, you know, it was just too much for me with my schedule with Letterman. He said, so what What I'd like to know, if you, if you would be willing to do this, is like you will work with Marty. You'll, you'll you know write the charts, you'll, you'll rehearse with Marty mm -hmm. and um, you'll rehearse the band. And then basically I'll, and, and then, so you'll do all the work and I'll come and walk on stage just when it starts and I'll get all the glory. <laughs> Where do I sign? Where do I sign? Come on, I'm ready. <laughs> basically, uh, if Paul calls, I, I do whatever he wants, whatever he wants me to do, because he's my guy. But um, so that's so that's so I did that for a number of years. So, so that was you know that was the, I looked forward to those two days, two days a year, for you know every year because two days with Marty Short is enough to cure you of all fails. It really, it really is. He's just he is the funniest human being on the face of the earth and. Uh, so doing that show, you know, I, I got to actually work with a couple of, you know, Steve Martin also on, on that. That was, a, that was, that was fun, but they don't do that anymore. They don't do the big gal. They don't do the, the show part anymore. Everybody cut down on the show mm -hmm. means that, you know, I'm glad I'm not starting now. <laughs> I started when they all won the show. Yeah. Here's some money. Go do the show. Okay, so so how about uh, uh, Aretha? What would that ha I can't even begin to imagine. Um, when when was that bet? I'm not going to be able to give you dates. I just know. Uh -huh. I, wait, wait. I can get. I can tell you one time. Mm -hmm. One time, I'll tell you what it was. It was. It was. It was one of. When Clive, there was a tribute to Clive was doing his uh, an Arista, like tribute to all his artists. Mm -hmm. He didn't like to fly, so she right. wouldn't go. And it was in L.A. And so we did it. In so I got the call to play to play with her, and to do this this taping with her. And basically, so we rehearsed and we a couple of songs, so which we then recorded, played, you know, taped for the show. So I forget where SAR, whatever, wherever we did mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that was on that show. And then I, um, oh I had the very, very good, good fortune to play with her for an, another, um, an, a Clive, they were honoring Clive Davis at, it was at the Waldorf and, um, Aretha, was on the show and she um she did ballet in a tutu to natural woman wow <laughs> wow yeah wow <laughs> yeah it was, they were all it was so funny and during the afternoon because she brought like seven legit ballet dancers with her and um i just, i remember a couple of things i remember Zet, we were playing we were on the we were on the floor. The, the orchestra was on the floor. <laughs> and Zeb was right in the middle. Zeb Katz was playing bass. Mm -hmm. Bald head, right in the middle of the stage, in front. And I remember when, when Aretha, when she finished and she took her big curtsy, she, I mean, basically her bosom was basically resting on Zeb's head. It was so... <laughs> she had the biggest bosom in the world. Wow. Big bosom. Bless her heart. 
So it was okay. So now, never intent was that not intimidating to play piano for Aretha? Um, and how was she? Was did she have opinion about what you were doing, or did she just leave you be? No, she was cool. I was. She was. I mean, I, I mean, when she played piano, she 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 did her ballet. I, <laughs> Aretha did she her might ballet. Have the ballet to to tape. She might have done the ballet to tape. And okay. Maybe not. I don't. I don't remember. I don't. Remember. But um. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember. I, I I'm I'm loving this. Uh, and that had to be thrilling for you, though. I it was, it was incredibly. It was. I mean, a thrill. Are you kidding me? I mean, she it's was. She she was it for me. I mean, Aretha Stevie. You know. Did you play with Stevie? Have you played with Stevie? I, I I have. I have. I played with him. Well, he wrote a song for one of um for uh, one of Whitney's records, and um, we did it on the Arsenio Hall show. Mm -hmm. And so um, we played with him. He did like a mini track, and we played. You know, we played the extra parts that were not on the track. Um, it was, you know, it was a record, it was a record. So, you know, she, they wanted it to be like, the, they wanted it to be the record. So he used some of the tracks and, and, um, left out, you know, left out synth bass, you know, left out all the parts for us to play. So, right. Um, anyway, so that was extraordinary. Um, I remember we waited, we were in rehearsal and we were rehearsing for a tour and we basically waited for him for eight hours and he didn't show up when he was at eight at, at six o'clock, he showed up at midnight and, you know, we couldn't leave. We had to stay and wait. And like, at that point I was even like, you know what? I've been here all day. I've been rehearsing my ass off. I am tired. Stevie, you better get here because I'm losing patience with you. Wow. I was patient. And then he walked in the room and then before we even started working on the track on the song, he sat and, you know, he sat next to me and played for an hour just played Stevie songs. So, so that was fine. Wow. But, but that's, as a matter of fact, I just watched, uh, I just watched that, um, that uh, taping of that show the other day. It was uh, my friend, Wayne Lindsay, who was the other keyboard player on that tour with, with me. Um, he posted it was on her, it was Whitney's birthday uh, in a couple of weeks ago. And so mm -hmm. he posted some stuff, some old footage because he took all this old footage. I don't even know where my stuff is. <laughs> I was going to say, did you shoot? Uh, did you, do you have stuff from? I, I know I do. I mean, I know I have, I have a shit ton of stuff. I just don't, you know, the camera is in my locker downstairs somewhere. I, I, I mean, I haven't broken that thing out in years. Yeah. Years. Yeah. But it exists. How, how about playing with, uh, with Al Green, with the Reverend? Well, that was amazing. Um, I was the musical director for um, at Rose Hall, no, Ro Roseland, not Rose Hall, Roseland. Mm -hmm. when, Les wrote when Roseland was alive. Mm -hmm. um, it was Hillary Clinton's, it was her last fundraiser for her senatorial run. I was there. You were? When, when Bill, Bill was president, she Bill was, was president. president. She was, it was her 50th birthday fundraiser birthday. and it was Robert De Niro and it was Gwyneth Paltrow and it was Ben Affleck and it was Nathan Lane. I, I was there because Gabe wrote the comedy that De Niro did with Bill. Cher. Cher. I was there. Was late. Harvey Weinstein produced the event. Yes. Cher yes. was late. Remember? Yes. And my friend Jimmy Nolan, who hired me. Jimmy Norton was the, is the the actor, and he was the uh, he was like the director of the show, mm -hmm. and so he and Nathan Lane did like they riffed, they went up there and like riffed while Cher was late getting there, but um, so you know there was the general play-ons and play-offs, but then I had uh, Al Green was one of the one of the musicians playing and Cher, so. I got to play with Al, and that was, what can I say? About God, that? I don't even remember he was there. That was the most overwhelming night. I actually was wait, in a limbo wait, 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 with wait, wait, to the party. Wait, I can't see. 
Oh, I, you know, I saw that picture. Wait, I'm going to send you mine. That Bill's, was nice. Bill's got his hand on my ass. And, and the, I, was, I was the most impressed with Bill. I'm pulling pictures because I'm still putting art up. You know, I had my whole part, my place painted. So I'm, I'm still putting my, see, this was what happened. The guys that painted oh. this keyboard on the wrong stand. So when yeah. I put it together today, it's yeah. So, and I can't lift that thing on my own. It's too heavy. Oh, wow. So, um, where were we? I can't believe you were there. That that was the most unbelievable night. That was the most unbelievable night. That was a wild night. Yeah, that was a wild night. And, and what was interesting to me about that night, the most interesting thing of all the stars that were there, De Niro, Tom Cruise, I mean, everybody was there. <laughs> Bill was the biggest star in the room. You couldn't take your eyes off of Bill. Well, Bill got up there at the end of the night after everybody finished and just no, no cue cards, no prompter spoke for 20 minutes. And, and like, he was the most charismatic person in there. Anymore, Bill. <laughs> he, was. Like, he was just, I mean, he was so, you know, he was, he was such, he's, he's just an incredible speaker, you know, I, yes. was, I love uh, listening to him speak. And then after, you know, all he wanted to do. So, we were trying to take pictures. Mm -hmm. Oh wait! So all he wanted to do was come and talk to the horn section. Come to hang <laughs> <laughs> there, and the, and the Secret Service, whatever. They're like, you know, they're following him, and you know, and uh, and like he's like, it's okay, guys, it's okay, you know. And he just comes, and so he's standing there, and all the guys are trying to take pictures. They're trying to take selfies. Right. The Bill. Uh -huh. Bill, and he sees that. And so he has one of his guys come over. He says, yeah, come on. We'll, we'll have somebody take the picture. You'll get the pictures. So that was the picture. Because we went to that after party. We were in a limo with Nathan Lane. And we went to the after party. And we got uh, our hotel. And we got our picture with Bill. And he said to Gabe, Gabe said, I wrote that sketch you did with De Niro. And he said, was I all right? What's your name? He said, I'm going to remember that. You know, And I kind of got the feeling that he would. You know, right. he was just that kind of guy yeah 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 he i yeah i got to meet him last year again i did oh wow at the public library it was an event uh, it was a hillary event at the public library very classy event i must say and i played with a string with a um a string quartet a string quartet and me nice it was fun. that, that, was, did, that you, was did you talk to him about that that other night no, mm -hmm. no, we didn't have a whole lot of time to chit chat. You know, mm -hmm. it was basically we were waiting for them. We just wanted to get a picture and we, you know, we have a picture. I have that. I don't know why I should have sent you that one. Um, but we got a picture that night. We were all in gowns. We were all dressed up. It was fun. Well, yeah, that was that was a pretty amazing night. That's that's an amazing thing. So, OK, so what what is it like uh, going from clubs and, and big concerts to playing on Broadway and doing the same show night after night. What, what, what was that like for you? I, well, know you I, think, I, I mean, the only shows that I ended up doing night after night were shows that I liked. Okay. I didn't go and try to sub on every show and I can't get arrested on Broadway. Nobody will hire me. What they, is that? All, all of, well, you know, it's like they have their people that have, mm -hmm have their people. I mean, I know they all know me. I've spoken to them. I write them all letters twice a year, mm -hmm. like biannual letter saying, Hey, I just want you to know I'm, I'm in town. And I, you know, if anything, I, I want to get, I would like to get involved with a show on the ground from the ground up. I don't want to go and sub every show on Broadway. And I, I don't have the patience for that. So, right. you know, when I did color purple, you know, that was just, you know, a blast. I did you know, once in a while. Sometimes I did it for like a, you know, a couple of weeks in a row and that was super fun. And then I did waitress. Um, I did waitress, I think like 10 days for like 10 days. How long ago? Uh, in 17. My daughter got to go on this. They do that karaoke thing once a month. Were you there for any, did they do that when you were there? No, but I, I heard about it. And she got pulled up and she got to, my daughter said, went to Tish. She wants to do musical theater. She got to stand on a Broadway stage and sing with them. And, and oh, that they, awesome. they tweeted about her and it was really cool. She got oh, to good. do that whole thing. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that yeah. was at 
that was a great show for me because you know both of those shows that I'm talking about were very piano driven. Right. The the music director is the piano player, and the whole band is on stage. So it's, you know, it's um, it was a it was it was right up my alley. Uh, the only reason I stopped do, I stopped doing it for personal reasons, nothing to do with the, the show. I loved it. I loved. I did it with Jesse Mueller. Mm -hmm. I did it with the late Nick Cordero. Oh God. Yeah, it was just a heartbreak. Uh, yeah. But um, so, so I, I don't really have leader of the pack. I subbed for Schaefer on Broadway. Mm -hmm. I didn't do the original down at the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I just subbed for him on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So I did it a couple of times. Right. I met Darlene Love. She looked down one night and she saw me playing and she was like, who are you? You know, who is this white girl in the bit? You know, so that was the beginning of our you know, our, we had a long, long relationship as well, Darlene and I, um, you know, I, I worked with her, did put many shows together for her. I was her musical director for a long time and did, and did a couple of shows down the bottom line that were written around her. Like we did um, back to a show called Back to Mono, which was the, the making of the Phil Spector Christmas record. And uh, Sonny Bono was on, was with us. He did it. Wow. By but um, that and that was Darlene, and then we did another show with Darlene, Portrait of a Singer, and and then I did like just shows with her, like at Rainbow and Stars or um, different clubs, you know, just and and theaters. So, Bet, did you get did you have a lot of gigs canceled when COVID happened? Did you have a lot of things on the book that got books that got canceled? Mm -hmm. Like did your life just like yeah, yeah, yeah. I went from being a, a working musician to a, <laughs> a non-working musician. But, you know, I mean, the business is, I'm, I'm kind of, it's not as shocking for me, you know, I've been watching the, the decline of this business for a long time. This, this business has been declining for 10 years, so, you know, it just sort of put a little rush on things, you know. But so, I, don't think, I think back in some way or other. What do you, what, if, if you could pick what you would do when things go back to normal, um, what of all the things you've done, what, 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 what speaks to you the most now? Like, what would you, would you want to tour? Would you want to record? Would you want to, what, what would? I would only want to tour with, a, a, I, w I don't want to tour just for the sake of touring. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would tour with certain artists that, you know, that, that I think that I would enjoy the music and that I would, that I could contribute to the, you know, my sensibilities would contribute to it. And I was, so it would be, uh, you know, it would be an enjoyable music experience plus an, plus personal, you know, R traveling on the road is not always, wow. Laura is now a category five. Oh, God. It, it, we're waiting for the locusts now. There's what, like, what, what, oh my God, a frog just hopped in my head. <laughs> There's this, this <laughs> I see frogs are coming in. Um, I think I know that. Oh, we haven't even talked about food yet. I think I know. That, did you write a book? Have you written some? A, did you write a book of some sort? No, to date? But, I, but I'd like to. Okay. So, yeah. Do you, know just, hmm? Do you know a book writer? Yeah, I wrote a book. Did you write uh, it? Which, uh, which Carl Reiner published. And uh, it's called Don't Jump, Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll, and My Fucking Mother. And that's the corner of the China Club. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, well, yeah, I, I really, what I'm really excited about doing right now is, you know, if Bonnie Raitt called me and asked me to go on tour with her, I would. Keb Mo had called me, you know, I had done a, um, one of the Home for the Holidays with Cindy mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Uh, Cab Mo was on, and mm -hmm. we kind of grooved. And he called me and uh, and said that he was thinking about making a change in his band, and you know, possibly, you know, he says this is all very premature. But is this something that you would be interested in? I said, my bags are packed. You know, <laughs> a lot of respect for him. I really like him, and I like his music, and mm -hmm. it would be really fun to play with him. I know, play and sing with him. Mm -hmm. But I'm really, you know, I did, um, I did last year, I, I had this, I've had this idea for Beth's Diner since I was with Whitney. That's how okay, so, so tell us that, how, how did that happen? Did, did okay, you open the book? 
idea for um, about 25 years ago. I did. Mm -hmm. a, I did a. Uh, I wrote a proposal. I had this idea for a cooking show. I've always been into food. Mm -hmm. Never as much as I'm in. Not as much as I'm in that now. I'm like super into food. Um, so I'm kind of glad that I. I did nothing happened until last year. I, I just want to interrupt you for a second because it looks to me I don't cook by recipe. I cook by feel. And from what I've watched of you, you really are a feel cooker. Am I right? Or I'm. I'm. I'm a feel cooker. Yeah, that's what I thought. Feel cooker. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind that, you know, when we are on, when we're doing shows, when, you know, when I was doing the best diner shows, I have, a, we make a recipe. You have to, because you have to tell people how much to use, right? Yeah. 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 But um, so anyway, so for those of you who don't know what Beth's Diner is, Beth's Diner was an idea that I had for a, a like a celebrity musical cooking show. Where I would, um, I think one of the working titles that I had was also called Dish. And then that got taken. But, you know, basically it was like, you know, bringing a, a, a my original idea was to bring a, you know, a musical guest on or a comedian or something, you know, whatever. But, um, and I'd interview them and, you know, we would play some of their music or if they were promoting something, play it, going to commercials, whatever. Was this before Daryl's house? Yes. This is, yes, this, I'm talking 25 years ago. Okay. So Daryl's house wasn't 25 years ago. No, but no. it's, it, it's, it's, it's a long time, but it's not 25 years. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. that was when I, I never did it then. I just wrote a broken right. proposal. Mm -hmm. And then many years later, I come back and I meet this last year. I'm at um, at this Desmond Child show. Ben Butler was the guitar player. And after the show, <coughs> we were hanging out down at the bar and his girlfriend was there, Kate McCauley. And she was I, I told she's a foodie and a photographer and a writer. And she loved the idea. And so I'm just going to try and make this story, this long story, very short. So okay. we, so I ended up doing the show, which is. I had different people on and I would, I would do my research and, you know, as you've done for me and, you know, I would do it. I do a little, little, uh, sort of a bio thing for, for the, for the folks. And I'd play and I play them on with one of their tunes with something, something of theirs. And, um, like I had, I had Janice Siegel on, I had Mark Rivera on, I had, um, Leon Pendarvis, mm -hmm. um, so it, I had Telly Leong, who was a big Broadway star. Um, and uh, yeah, and it was amazing. So we would cook, you know, they would say, I would say to them, what do you want to cook? You know, is this something you want to learn or you want to bring in a recipe? So most people brought a recipe. Uh -huh. Telly Leong wanted to learn how to make shrimp scampi. So I taught him how to make it instead of using pasta, like use like a wild rice, you know, make it just a little so that was a good episode. That was a good dish too. But so then we'd make a dish, we'd cook, we'd I'd continue to interview them while they're cooking and I'm helping. And then after that, we, you know, we camera shot on the food, we take a bite, mmm, delicious. <laughs> now, let's go sing. And then we'd go over to my white piano and uh, to the piano and we would do a song. And that's the show. That's yes, I've watched a few episodes. They're wonderful. Really fun. And, you know, it, it, it combines two things that I truly love. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I have been doing solely music for a very long time. Mm -hmm. You know, there are other things that I like to do as well, you know, like cooking. I'm really into cooking. So um, so doing that show. So I'm, do, I'm about to do. So I thought of another idea over this over the pandemic to do um, dinner for one. Which I love because that's what a lot of us are doing right now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I, and I always cook for myself and mm -hmm. I just don't throw something in the microwave or throw something on the stove. I mean, I, I'm the queen of my castle and I yeah. deserve to eat well, if, you know, why, why should we eat better when we're with people? You know what I mean? If, so you have leftovers. So you'll eat. I was going to say, do you make enough to have leftovers? So, I mean, cause it's a lot of work to cook like a whole thing. Only sometimes. Mm. Like sometimes I'll make a, if I make a curry, I'll usually that can, I can make that a two day thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like to cook. So I'm like, okay, let's start from scratch today. You know, what are we going to do today? So, and I cook like, I cook for myself like that every day, almost every day. I'd say oh. four to five days a week. 
And how, so how much time will you assign between, because preparation takes more time than the cooking, I find. How much, what, what does dinner become an hour, two hours? What, what? Well, it's not, it's not the dinner. It's just, the, it's the concept of cooking for one person. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that you deserve more than ordering a sandwich from the deli or, you know, or whatever the easy thing is, you know, heat up, heat up the Trader Joe's frozen, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I like to dine. So do you have a lot of stores? Like when I'm, when we're not in pandemic, I usually, I have like five grocery stores and I go to different ones for different things. I can't get everything in one store. New York's a little, yeah, I was that way in New York too. No, so, no, no. I go to, I, I go to Fairway for coffee. Mm -hmm. I buy my coffee at Fairway. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also will go there, for, look at meat sometimes. Um, uh, Cinderella for mozzarella. Best mozzarella, Cinderella. Not fish? Yes, fish and fish. Mm -hmm. But actually, what you know, I mean, in this in the winter, more for fish. In the summertime, I go to the farmer's market on Columbus Avenue and 77th Street, and the fish guy, the American seafood guy, is there from Long Island. And everything is, like, right off the boat. Wow. <clears throat> so I buy, like, swordfish and cod or scallops. Mm -hmm. and, and is that still going on in the pandemic? Yeah. I think they weren't for a while, but then they set it up the way they want. You know, they set it up with like, you know, this, you walk this way, everybody has to wear a mask. They won't serve you if you don't have a mask. This, they have the six feet markings on the sidewalk for all the different mm -hmm. things. And it's very well organized and it, and it really works. It works. I feel pretty safe there. I, you know, I go every Sunday. I have not been into in a supermarket in six months. Everything I order everything in. It's it's the thing I miss the most of all is food shopping. I miss what? it too much. Well, you're having a worse off than we are here. We have it really bad right now. But I can't believe when it was really bad in New York, you were going into stores. I, I well, I, I was first of all when I I, I wasn't. I would go mm -hmm. would shop once every ten days. Mm -hmm. I'm taking you with me for a second because I don't know how to do this. Wait, oh. listen. Because I have to just get some water. Because um, I'm choking, as you can hear. Yeah, sure. um, so, I, you know, I would order in. The ordering in thing, though, know, was from, like, you know, it was, I ordered once one night from Fairway. Mm -hmm. At 10 o'clock at night. And they said, oh, we have everything. Oh, will you accept these these replacements? And I said, yes, of course. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm figuring it'll get to me. By four in the afternoon, seven thirty in the morning, my doorbell rings. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a bag of food with great Gatorade and chicken soup. That's all they brought me. Wow. It was like I mean that's what was happening. You weren't getting everything you ordered. Mm-hmm. You know, from anywhere, from Whole Foods, Whole Foods. Sometimes you have, you have to wait two weeks for your order. There was a time, my mother's only ordered, she's on the Upper West Side, and it was horrible for a long time. But things are much better now as far as all of that's kind of gotten more normalized. Well, New York is, def I mean, everybody, you still have to wear a mask. You go in, Trader Joe's, there's a line. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, they just told me that... Um, that they're ending the uh, the all day seniors line. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> yeah, I went I went there for flowers tonight, and they, she said, you know, starting Monday, mm -hmm. it's only going to be from eight to nine, and then after that, it's just going to be one line. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. that ends my shopping at <laughs> <laughs> I Guess that. Do they, do they have senior shopping? You know, I know they do this the seniors thing out here for. The supermarkets and for Trader Joe's, do they do it in New York? Other than Trader Joe's? Yeah, they do it at Whole Foods, but I don't. You know, I don't. That's you know, you have to get up in the morning to go. Yeah. To. Yes, I know. And one thing that has changed, except for when I had when I was sick. Mm -hmm. When I was sick, I think I'm having like an allergy attack or something. Mm -hmm. When I was sick, 
Um, I forgot what I was saying. Um, about sh going shopping. Well, I, I, I just, I don't remember what I was going to say, but I don't remember what I was going to say. I lost my train of thought. Well, you obviously didn't go out to stores when you were sick. No, my sister brought me food. She came in three times with um, food for me, supplies. She would, I'd leave my trash outside my front door and uh, she'd take it to the trash and leave my food and met, we'd wave and she would go, cry and think she, because she thought that I was dying. <laughs> she thought I was going to die. My poor sister thought I was going to die, but I didn't die. Wait, wait, did, did, were you afraid of that when you got no, it? Not at all. Mm -hmm. No. Because you didn't, you didn't have the lung thing. Had I had that, I would have, because I'm very claustrophobic and I've had, mm. I've had, I've been sick where like I, where you get, I was so full of mucus at times where like it was like swallowing was hard, breathing was hard mm -hmm. and I'm claustrophobic. So that kind of makes, puts me in a panic and that wouldn't, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work well for me. Yeah. How am I doing with the eyes, by the way? We've been talking. You're doing, you're doing very well. I'm, I've only been looking at you. I haven't been trying to look into the camera, but it looks like you're looking right into the, you're looking right into the camera. It's great. You're doing really well. I have no you idea. That expertly. Um, so I have a last question for you. So coming out of this thing, and I started to say it before, you do a lot of things. You've done a lot of things. If you had your druthers, what, what, would you like to keep doing a lot of things? Is there something that re is really calling to you now? Is there somebody that you'd love to play with? I mean, I, I know you said Bonnie Ray. Is um, is there uh, Lee Sklar is a dear friend of mine. Is there is there is there somebody that you would love to play with that you have yet to do? Is there is there a project that call? Is there something you'd love to do coming out of this? Um, I'd love to be able to sell Bet's Diner. And um, so my partner, who's um, who who is just had foot surgery, so she's having has a lot of free time. She's gonna mm -hmm. she who's shot and edited the whole, the first season of Bed's Diner, so she's going to be she's working on a sizzle reel for me. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm I'd like to shop it, you know. I'd like to shop it and try and like maybe to YouTube TV or something, you know. Try and try and get it, you know. I, I would like I'd like to be able to make money on it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to be able to, you know, turn that into a way of making some money as well. You know, doing two things that I love. So, yeah, yeah. So that's basically, you know, um, I always, you know, I also, I always have my, my African safari, which is in the back of my head always go back to Africa and actually do a safari. And that's at like top of my list is Africa. And um, so I'd like to go to Africa. <laughs> Um, but project wise, music wise, mm -hmm. right now I just feel so detached from everything. It's hard mm -hmm. to hard to. Are you doing any um, virtual music with anybody? No, I, not really. I'm not. I mean, I I did. No, not really. I did. I actually worked last weekend. I went up to Connecticut and and recorded uh, with a, a band that I play with. Um, do you know Chris Barnes? I know the name. I don't know Chris. Well. Um, so he did, I did a Hokum Blues record that Will actually produced. Mm. And it was me and uh, Will and Jimmy Vivino and Pelton, Sean Pelton. I know Jimmy, no Will. Um, so anyway, so he won, he, we, we recorded a Zoom concert, which I don't know when it'll be on, but we did that. And um, that was the first time being in a, in a room with musicians in six months, basically playing music. And I was, and my hands were really tired on Sunday because we played for basically four hours with very little break. Wow. And I haven't done that since I'm home. You know, I, was it fun? It was fun. Yes, of course it was fun. It was, you know, I, I love to play with humans. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as much fun. I mean, like I, I, me and the bass player wore masks and that, that's, you know, that's to me. That wasn't live playing because we we had no audience. Right. Yeah. Have you seen this thing? I don't. I guess they're not doing it in New York. How would they? But there's a big drive-in thing going on out here now. I heard about that. Uh, do you know Melanie Taylor? She was a harlot for a while. I don't know if she was. Of course, when you I know. Melanie. 
So Melody just did um, uh, a drive-in concert, and she was saying her favorite thing now is horns honking. That's the new clapping, right? Is horns honking. Was it her show, solo show? No, she was uh, singing with someone, and I don't remember who she was singing with. I just watched a video last night. I, I, I don't think I knew the woman who was uh, singing lead. Okay, I gotta, I'll reach out to Mill and ask her. Um, yeah, it's on Facebook, yeah. We spoke about a month, we actually talk, talked about it a month ago. Um, we're friends. Um, she's a dear girl. Yes, she's terrific. And so, so yeah, so this whole thing about drive-ins are kind of like the thing now. Uh, a lot of people are doing them out in California. Yeah, well, you know, we don't have a whole heck of a lot of drive-ins. No. Well, we didn't hear either, but we will now. But I think they're going to be resurrected everywhere now because right. it's kind of like safe entertainment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've got to figure something out because we need entertainment. I mean, Absolutely. people need, people need, I mean, I, I, you know, it's kind of blows my mind that I've never heard any of them talk about like the fact that, you know, the people of the arts are, have been sidelined. I mean, musicians, actors, you know, people that work behind, you know, stage, stage crews. I mean, mm -hmm. just sidelined, you know, mm -hmm. you never hear them talk about, I mean, Mr. Fuckhead would like just to be, you know, he'd like it if there it were no arts. He doesn't care about arts. He, you know, yeah. he pull all the money from arts. Pull mm -hmm. PBS. Mm -hmm. You know, pull, pull PBS up the air. Because he, he has no use for it. So if he has no use for it, he doesn't understand. He doesn't see where other people have use for it. So right. unfortunately, until we get, you know, we get a, a real human back in office, you know, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have that back. We'll have arts back or people that care about arts back. Have you been writing um, music during this, during COVID? No, mm -hmm. really, not a lot of music. No, I haven't. I haven't been writing, writing, writing. I, it's weird. No, I mean there, are, there are t there are times when I'm when I wake up and I'm motivated. Mm -hmm. um, before I got sick, I was super motivated. When the lot when the lockdown first happened, I was super motivated. And and after I was sick, like immediately after I was sick, I was practicing. I was getting up. I was practicing every day. Mm -hmm. I was taking Spanish lessons. Working out on the, with the, you know, working out. Now I screwed myself because I bought a new coffee table that can't move. So the other one I was able to move and so I could just put it all on the, on the big screen TV and I could, so now I'm a little compromised, but uh, <laughs> I've got it all worked out. But, um, you know, some days I'm motivated and some days I'm just not, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's one area where I wish that I lived with somebody mm -hmm. because I would be motivated by seeing somebody else get up in the morning and not go make coffee and get back to bed. Okay, we haven't even talked about this. I, I I've gone through this all alone, and I didn't. I it, I we didn't we didn't we haven't talked about that. Um, how how I'm I'm really COVID weary being alone, eating every meal alone. Uh, it's I'm finding it really, really trying. How, how how has it been for you emotionally to spend this much time alone? Well, I have my breakdowns. Mm -hmm. You know, I have my breakdowns. Um, I have started to, I'm going to go out for dinner Friday night with my friend, um, Claudia. Um, you know, outdoor seating. I've been, I've been to, out to eat like three times in six months. Out, you know, because now that now you would not believe, you would not recognize New York right now, Vicky. This, I, I, people send me pictures. My, I, 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 it's all in the street, right? The tables are in the streets. Yeah, streets and the sidewalks. Everybody, everybody. I mean, if they're gonna stay, if they're gonna stay alive, you know, they're gonna supply that service, and people are dying for it. We, you know, people were dying to get out. You know, and not all of them are doing it as well as others. Mm -hmm. You know, and I go to the place. I will go to the places that that feel that I see are doing it right. You can't socially distance though in a restaurant. You can't. They can't. Every table can't be six feet apart. And right. when you're sitting across from somebody at a table, you have to take your mask off. You're not obviously not six feet apart. Right. Well, I wouldn't go out to eat with somebody that I had any suspicion about being COVID, having COVID. I would only go to eat with somebody that I knew was safe. I'm not like, 
it's I'm not seeing like a million friends. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm I'm you know I I'm not seeing a million friends. I see like a handful of friends, a handful of friends. Mm -hmm. My friend Marcy, um, Elaine Caswell came you know came out. Um, we didn't talk about the Bev Leslies either. I know um, we didn't, and I like, watched a bunch of videos today too. <laughs> Elaine Caswell um, came out to the beach the other day, so I, you know, I saw her. Kate McCauley, um, I'm actually going to go out to her apartment on Saturday. You know, we were we were together, and I'm going to go over and, you know, she's she had foot surgery, she can't do anything, so I'm going to go over and watch tennis with her and cook her food. Um, do you do mass when you're with your friends, or do you? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. unless we're eating. Mm -hmm. I mean. If I've been in my apartment with like my with Marcy, like Marcy and I, when we're in the apartment, we don't, you know, I don't do masks with her anymore. And she can come into my apartment and I can go into her apartment. I stayed over her apartment last week as she she is in loft. She stays upstairs and I stay downstairs on the couch. <clears throat> but I'm super careful still. And I don't want to get it again. I've had it and I don't I, I don't want it. But it, you know, I definitely, you know, I went through I was good for a while because I, I kind of saw it as like a reboot, mm -hmm. you know, because I was actually rebooting. I was actually, you know, doing different workouts and I was practicing. I, you know, I started practicing an a, a new etude and learning a new language. And, you know, so it was kind of a reset for me. And I was like mm -hmm. going to bed at 10 o'clock at night, waking at 1030, waking up at, you know, early and, and, get, and getting up, having a coffee and getting up. Mm -hmm. Have you know, I have two, co I, go, I go two rounds with the coffee and that sometimes keeps me in the bedroom till about 1130. <laughs> but the truth is, where do I have to, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's very different for you. My mother is starting, she's going to Fairway and Zabar's and eating at restaurants. It's making me crazy because she didn't leave her house for five months and now that she had a taste, now with she the she lives um, on uh, right where it used to be the Gap, but she's like on 89th Broadway. She'll kill me for saying that out loud, but yeah, huh. yeah. Well, okay. Well, but as long as she's being, you know, you know, she had a guy in her apartment and the worker with the mask down, and they're talking in her den, and I'm I'm sitting on the family Zoom screaming in my head, right. and uh, you know, I haven't done anything. My son hasn't been in my house in six months. Uh, we, I see him outside. It is. I have my boyfriend has not been in my house. We needed a park. I'm COVID crazy, and um, I haven't been in a store. Yeah, but well, it's the numbers are terrible here. They're terrible. Your numbers are awful, and our numbers were. I mean, we when I got COVID, it was, you know, one in every five people had yeah had COVID, mm -hmm. and that's kind of like I know that's kind of where it was in Florida. You know, they were at twenty percent, and mm -hmm. and. You know these other places. You know Arizona, Texas. Mm -hmm. We're not so, much better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but now you know we're under one percent. So, you know, I, I, I'm trying to like, like not uh, not be as extreme. You know, uh, you know, if I'm sitting on a bench in the park and like on, on the park on the on the Central Park West and somebody walks mm -hmm. by without a mask, I'm not going to go. Where's your mask? You know where I will in a store. I will harass you if you don't have a mask on in a store that requires masks. Mm -hmm. And it ends up, you know, being ugly always, but you know, I, I can't help it. I see people, it's like, you're an idiot. You're just an idiot, okay? You're an idiot. So they're not enforcing- uh, when But everywhere, you walk around the Upper West Side, Vicki, you walk around downtown, everybody's, everybody in New York is wearing masks. See, not here. And here it's bad. And I go for a speed walk in my neighborhood and more than half the people are not. Most are not. Yeah. They go out and they don't wear masks. Most of the time, no. I mean, I'm in a very sleepy town and there's not, it, uh, it's, I don't even say it on here, but I'm Glendale adjacent, but it's a foothill town, small town. And most people don't wear masks. And um, they have to in the stores, I guess, but I, yeah. It's all freaks me out. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm immune compromised. I have high antibodies anyway. I, I got, got diagnosed with Hashimoto's right before this happened. Oh, really? So normal antibody count is 50 and mine was over a thousand. So I'm the kind of person that if God forbid I were to get it, um, it, your own body tends to attack 
you know, it attacks the virus. And so I'm already so antibody crazy that it's scary for me. Yeah, you can't mess around. You know, people that are vulnerable just can't mess around. Older yeah. people, people with heavy and I'm old. men who are heavy, hmm. um, you know, just you're just diabetes. It's like it's no it's no joke. It's hmm. not no joke. Yeah, and you see a guy like a vibrant guy like Nick, who's 41 years old, healthy as a hog, you know, got it. They don't even know how he, you know, manager doesn't even know how he got it. And, you know. I saw him bullets over Broadway. He was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, Bet, this has been, you know, I, it's so funny because I, I've been Bet aware since the 80s. I mean, I, I know I met you with Conti and everything, and I've seen you on Facebook over the years, but this is the first conversation we've ever I know. had. I know. So, um, <laughs> Next time I come to play, we're going to hang out. I, gonna... I can't wait. I would love that. You can fly and things. Can, will that ever, I, I usually come to New York. I, I, my, my Facebook memories were all New York up until this year, and yeah, I'm usually there a lot. So this is killer to not. My daughter's there. My mother's there. It's crazy. Oh, your daughter's My daughter works at Tribeca Grill. She's an actress. So she graduated Tisch last year. And, and uh, yeah. Amazing. And she's getting on a plane to go to Detroit with her boyfriend, who's in the Detroit Jazz Festival next week. And I'm losing my mom. I bought them these crazy masks, and I'm losing my mind. But Death and the Visors. I get that. I didn't get them the shield yet. I got them this mask. That's like, it, you look like you're Darth Vader or something, but it's supposed to be very protective, but. Goggles. And got, and they have to wear, yeah, but you know, she's 22. They're going to do what they're going to do. She gets on the subway. I mean, it's all, have you been on the subway? Once from, se from 79th street to 103rd. And how was that experience? It was fine. There was hardly anybody on the train. Mm -hmm. It was before. It was before people went back to work. It was like about a month ago. It was when I was trying to get a COVID test. So mm -hmm. it was about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was you know there. I mean the train. I mean what I hear is that the trains are better than they've ever been. They're cleaner than they've ever been. Right. You know they they don't they're they're closed from one at night to four five in the morning. They mm -hmm. clean every day sanitize them and uh so apparently they're safer than you know than ever except what i've heard is that the sanitizing i'm, I'm taking these what this i've heard the sanitizing is all a waste of time because it's really just the air they need to take the air and pull pull the air out rather than keep the circ the air circulating within that that's the secret to to stopping you know to keeping things at bay is sucking the air out well they yeah well, they do have windows in the train, so who knows? I don't know. But I'm not dying to do it. You know, I was volunteering for a while down at uh, Animal Haven, um, down at what, down in Chinatown, and I stopped. Well, they stopped, but you know, I had also I stopped a little earlier just because I didn't feel like I didn't feel good getting in the train and going all the way downtown every day and back. I mean, every once a week and back. I, I just. We've been talking forever, but I have to ask you a last question that I didn't even think of. What is it with you and big game cats? I mean, I get the cats, but I've seen you with big game cats. Big cats, big cat, big lions. Yeah, well, um, when I was in Vegas, I was in Vegas for two years with Bette Midler. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a residency at the Coliseum uh, at Caesars, and I we were going on a break, and I... One, and there were two things that I want. I was talking to one of the dressers, like after sound check. I said, you know, there's two things that I wanted to do before I left Vegas. I wanted to go to the sanctuary because I had met the Keith Evans, the guy who ran the. Um, do you remember the um, in the MGM Grand? There was a, they used to have a glass enclosed lion sanctuary in there. Uh huh. Uh huh. I I worked there a lot. I did a lot of shows there. So. Um, so I remember I would always go to see the cats and get a picture with the cub and hold so I could play, hold a cub or whatever. And I, you know, got to talk, talking to Keith, the owner, and he said, yeah, we have a sanctuary, you know, some next time, sometime you can come out. So it turns out that this woman who was the dresser knew them because she and her husband like had a magic act and they would rent animals from them. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, <clears throat> so the next day, I went, I got, I went to the farm, to the ranch and got to meet them and, and 
got my first uh, tour with the cats. And then when we went on a break for six weeks, came back and she texted me at one point. She goes, don't look now, but when you come back, the day after you come back, we're picking up two cubs that we bought from a breeder. And um, sure enough, so those are Pebbles and Ray Ray that I helped rear from two weeks old to six months old. I really thought we were going to have a Siegfried and Roy uh, story. So um, <laughs> how could it be Vegas and big game cats and not Siegfried? And, but it's not. So that's just crazy right there. But yeah, it was a, it was a privilege to uh, to be that close with these animals. And wow. then uh, they had then my cats, the ones that I helped raise, they had a litter. And so I went out there to see their litter and there were mm. like seven of them. It was like, oh, my God, it was crazy about those animals and you're fearless with them yes wow until 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 a certain age you know until i i mean after you i couldn't yeah after six months old they're still kittens mm -hmm. but they know their own strength mm -hmm. and their claws get big and they can scratch you and mm -hmm. you know they don't mean to hurt you but they can't help it <laughs> right about them is harmful yeah <laughs> the teeth <laughs> So, all right. So uh, now I have one last question. What are you watching? Are you watching anything on, uh, have you loved anything that you found? Have you like gotten hooked on anything? Well, I mean, I watched things. Well, I forgot about the stuff that I watched in the beginning. Like um, mm -hmm. I watched, what, what was that? There was that one, I forget what it was called um, about the Jews in Williamsburg. The uh, I saw. No, not just. No, oh, oh, not just. Um, yeah. Uh, um, oh, the same girl, and of course now I can't think of what it's called, but yes, I loved that. Uh, unorthodox. Unorthodox. Mm -hmm. Loved that. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed Stissel. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I then watched um, When he when Heroes Fly, which oh, is an Israeli film. That's incredible. Okay. The guy who's in Stissel uh -huh. stars in that, and like, wait till you see him without uh -huh. him. I love him so much. I can't stand how much he, I love him. He is so fine. Anyway, yeah, that was a good is. movie. Uh, that was when, a good movie. when Heroes Fly, I'm writing it down. Heroes Fly, yeah. Okay. I just watched, um, I'll give it a little, I, I, I just watched um, Dirty John. Do you know about Dirty John? I've heard about it's it. It's first on a, based on a true story. It is really upsetting. Which um, one is it about? It, it's a guy. It's a crazy guy who uh, marries. Uh, Connie Britton is the is the wife, and uh, it's a guy who basically stalks women and abuses. You know, he's terrifying. Eric Ban Banya is that his name? Uh -huh. It's uh, it's worthy. I heard it's really good. I've heard it's it really good. worthy. But now I have to find the documentary because I heard there's a documentary out there. And now I want to see it because I just finished the series. Well, I loved Dead to Me. Oh yeah, fabulous. Dead to Me, Mrs. America. Oh, I didn't see that one. Okay. Really? On Hulu. It is so good. All right. I'm ready for something now. Did you mm -hmm. watch Shit's Creek? I have. I've watched part of it. I, I know that I have. I should be watching that. Like, you know, everyone was trying to get me to watch Shit's Creek for year, all these years. And I resisted. I resist. And I got to tell you, I like cried when I got to the end. I, I miss them so much that I can't bear it. It was the, it's the most joyful thing on the planet. It, I can't recommend it highly enough. Yes, I know. I know they're my favorite com comic actors. Yeah. She's crazy. Fantastic. Anyway. All right. We've been talking for like two and a half hours. This is ridiculous, you know, but it's COVID. So what else? Who knew? What else do we have? <laughs> I know. Except I have to go make food. It's dinner time. Okay, so yeah, what, what, what did you eat for dinner uh, tonight? Well, I made a turkey burger, a very fancy turkey burger, and I have a salad, which okay. is still waiting for me. Okay, very good. You're having an allergy attack. You need to take care of it. Yeah, I'm of really sorry. I'm having an allergy attack. That's okay. Now I understand. I, I, I've been there. I'm sorry. Anyway, thank you so much for doing this, Bet. It was so fun to get to know thank you. Thank you so much for asking me. It was so much fun talking about myself. I, <laughs> Yes, well, it was joyful for me as well to hear about it. I realized that I should, I should write a book. You, you should write a book. 
You have great stories. And I'm sure we've just scratched the surface. So I look forward to reading it. I'll see you soon. Good to see you. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. See you tomorrow.